In the name of the Father, and of the Holy Spirit, and God, amen. Today is the third Sunday of the Blessed Month of Baona. And we take the reading today from Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 37. It's rich, it's full. There's so many things to talk about. Today I'm going to focus on verse 25, mainly. Verse 25 says, But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And I want to talk about this verse in the context of the church. The church today, in this season, we are in the apostles' fast. I'm not sure if everybody knows that, but we should be fasting uh, during these days. The fast concludes around July 12th um, for the Feast of St. Peter and St. Paul. St. Peter and St. Paul said words very similar to Christ. He had something to say about a house divided. They both did. Listen to the words of St. Paul. St. Paul said, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgments. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen to the words of St. Peter. He also said something very similar. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. This is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. This is not a suggestion to be of one mind. St. Peter and St. Paul are not saying that this is something that would be nice to have theoretically. It's a command. He says, do this. All of you be of one mind. What does it mean to be of one mind? This unity that, we're, that Christ is speaking about. It means that you have to think the same way. It means that you reason the same way. It means that you understand the same way. It means that being of one mind is the opposite of division. It's the opposite of individualism. To have a whole group of people be of one mind is to say, I need to conform to the truth. It's not for me to say that the truth needs to conform to me. <coughs> this is not the only place in scripture that we see this requirement, this command. It, that's given to us by God. It's throughout scripture. Let me give you a few examples. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 15, we read, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Jesus Christ, that you may be with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Finally, brethren, farewell, be complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be, will be with you. In Philippians chapter 1, <clears throat> Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or an absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. In Ephesians chapter 4, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. This is a familiar prayer that we pray in the first hour of that day. This is the word of God. This is scripture. These are not suggestions. These are commands. Unity of belief, unity of faith, unity of thought and understanding and of judgment is actually a requirement of God. So when we look across the country today and we see 30,000 different understandings, different faiths, different ways to understand God, different ways to understand Christ, different ways to understand the scripture and the faith. And then when we see people radically disagreeing with each other over how baptism should be done and disagreeing with each other of how sins are forgiven or how salvation is obtained or whether the Eucharist is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ or if it's symbolic. This is division. This is scattering. This is direct disobedience to what has been commanded in the scriptures. Our Lord God has never left the option open to us to come up with our own ideas for what the Christian faith is supposed to look like. 
He didn't give us that authority, that creativity. He didn't leave it up to us. He taught the apostles the same doctrine, the unity of faith. He gave them the same practices. He started the one church, not 30,000 churches. He started the one church. And throughout scripture, as we have just read, over and over and over, we are commanded by the word of God to be of one mind, to believe the same thing. There is no point anywhere in the scripture that you can turn where Jesus or any of the apostles say, you know what? Do whatever is comfortable for you. Believe whatever you need to believe and God will be with you. Never says that. It's not biblical. It's not scriptural. Scripture says that if we are to be Christians, that we are to be of one mind. And the only way that we're going to come to this unity of belief is for every single one of us willing to have humility and humble enough to bring our beliefs and our thinking into agreement with what the church has historically taught on these things. That's the key. The church is not a club where everyone gets to hang out and enjoy each other's company while continuing to believe whatever they want to believe. It's not how it works. So how do we do this? Well, this is what we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to have a cult. This is not some personality cult. You should never ever say, well, here's what I think and here's what I do because we should do whatever the preacher says. Now, that's how cults get started. And there's many examples of that happening in our day and age. When you allow one person to stand up in front of you and simply say, I'm going to do whatever the leader says, I'm going to think whatever the preacher thinks, that's the beginning of a cult. That's not how we do this, because he himself may be wrong on some things. And so if we're going to be of one mind, that means that even the preacher needs to be humble enough to bring his own mind into the conformity of the truth and what the church teaches. Again, how are we not supposed to do this? It's not some partial agreement. We're not supposed to think alike in the sense of like the least common denominator. For example, sometimes I hear things like the sentiment like, you know, we disagree on like 98% of things, but we at least we agree on these three basic things. I mean, you know, Jesus is God. Bible is the word of God. And Jesus is the only way to heaven. Like we believe on these three things. We have perfect unity on these three things. We feel like this is great. No, St. Paul did not say, be of one mind on three basic things. The word of God does not say, be perfectly in agreement and thinking on two or three basic things. What does scripture say? It says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. No divisions among you. He didn't say no divisions in the basics. No, no divisions on anything when it comes to the faith. That's what scripture says. And as far out as that seems and as unattainable as that may sound at first, that is what scripture requires. This is the goal that we work towards. So how do we do this? Scripture gives this big, big command. And it gives this command over and over and over. So how do we fulfill it? How do we do what God requires us to do? Well, let's take, let's take categories. Let's look at scripture. One of the things that we do is the way that we look at scripture. There's a couple of ways that we can approach scripture. The first way is do we interpret scripture for ourselves? This might be crucial. You can take all of your backgrounds, your prejudices, all of your ideas, and you can sit in a corner by yourself with the Bible, and you can come to certain conclusions. You can, you can, you can do this over and over, and you can come to certain conclusions. And then, you know, maybe, maybe Mark can do the same thing. Maybe he can also sit in the corner, read the Bible, and he can come to his own conclusions. 
And then Lucas could do the same thing, and he comes to his own conclusions. If all of us in this room do that, then we come up with, with hundreds of different interpretations of what the Word of God says. So just reading the Bible for yourself and setting yourself up as the interpreter of the Scripture is how we get into this mess in the first place, 30,000 different ways to think about the Scripture. This is how we end up with divisions between the Orthodox and the Catholics and the Anglicans and the Lutherans and the Baptists and the Methodists. And the... So that can't be right. There's no fruit. The fruit doesn't match with what the command says. So how do we do it? How does the Orthodox Church do it? They interpret the scripture through the church. The way that we have to read the scripture and interpret it must be in line and in agreement with how the church historically has interpreted the scripture, even before the divisions even took place. That means you have to go back and say, in the beginnings of the church, before any of these divisions took place, how did the church see the scripture? In the first thousand years of the church, did the church see and interpret the scripture saying that the Eucharist is to be taken as the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? The answer is yes. So this is what we do on every piece of doctrine. We read the scripture, we study the scripture, but we make sure that we're seeking scripture as interpreted historically by the church, not by our own minds when we're reading it by ourselves, but reading scripture in line with how the church has historically interpreted it. It's crucial. Let's look at the councils. Nobody really likes talking about the, hist the history of the councils and stuff like that, but I'm going to go there. <clears throat> I won't go too crazy. In the first two ecumenical councils, I see it in Constantinople, we receive a clear articulation of the doctrine of the Trinity. If you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, you can thank those men at the first two ecumenical councils. If you believe in the Nicene Creed, you can thank the men full of the Holy Spirit at the first two ecumenical councils. The first two councils focus on his deity, putting down the Arians, putting down this blasphemous idea that Jesus is not God, and lifting him up as the second person of the Trinity, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not created, of one essence with the Father. He is fully God. He is fully man. Look at the third council. St. Mary is called the mother of God. And honestly, this was not even intended to be an exaltation of St. Mary. The calling of St. Mary, of the mother of God, is a protection of the deity of Christ. Because who was born of St. Mary? Jesus. Well, is he God or not? If she is not the mother of God, then Jesus is not God. So you cannot fully believe in the deity of Christ if you're not willing to call St. Mary the mother of God. Now, does this mean that she is pre-existent and that she gave birth to God the Father? No, of course not. Calling St. Mary the Theotokos, calling her the mother of God, simply means that the person that she gave birth to in Bethlehem that first Christmas is God. So when you call her the mother of God, you are making a statement about who her son is. That's so important. So we look at scripture the way that it has been interpreted by the church, the historic church. We look at the councils through which the Holy Spirit has spoken to his church. We look at the early church writings of our fathers. Who are the early church fathers? They are simply the early Christians who were faithful to Christ, who followed the teaching of the, of the apostles. Examples would be St. Ignatius of Antioch. He was ordained to the priesthood by St. Peter himself. There's St. Polycarp. He was a disciple of St. John. So who are we going to trust? 
preachers who knew the apostles face to face or some random person on TV or on YouTube that's preaching with their own interpretation. As for me, as for this church, as for the churches in the Orthodox Church in this diocese, we trust those men who knew the apostles and their disciples. For the first few hundred years of faithful Christians who were so near in the timeline to the apostles and to Christ himself, who faithfully kept what Christ taught. We also look at the liturgies, these liturgies that have been handed down. We are brought into conformity of mind and belief in the truth by looking at the historic liturgies that we still do today. The Holy Spirit speaks through his church, through scripture, speaks in the councils, speaks in the writings of the church fathers, and also in the liturgies that we use every week to worship God. One example is, what do we believe about the Eucharist? Well, you can go to Scripture and see that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. That is clearly set forth. But you also can, can supplement that or you can uh, corroborate with that with the liturgy. In almost every Orthodox liturgy that is used on Sunday mornings throughout the world, there is this prayer. The Holy Body and the precious true blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of our God. Amen. We say, Amin, 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 I believe, I believe, I believe, and confess to the last breath that this is the life-giving flesh of your only begotten Son. This is what historic, the historic church believed of the offering that was on the, on the altar. In this prayer, in this confession, we confess that truly Christ's own precious body and his, and his precious blood are not symbolic. We confess that in our prayer, with our mouth, every time that we come to take Eucharist. This is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. This is not only in Scripture, it's not only in the writings of the Church Fathers, it's also in the liturgies. Look at the hymns. Probably an unpopular topic. You can tell by the attendance of our hymns class after Sunday school. Look at the hymns. Look at the ancient hymnology of the church. The hymns, the songs of the saints who have written and have been sung over hundreds of years in the liturgies of the church. We learn doctrinal truths. We learn the truth from these hymns of our church. These things that have been handed down from generation to generation. Hymns bind tradition and rites and worship and spirituality. They are so important. They are so important. Not just to the kids, but to the adults as well. Look at the icons of the church. We're also brought into the oneness of faith, the oneness of mind, the oneness of understanding of the truth through the icons. The historic iconography of the church it has been throughout the history of the church. Coptic icons are mirrors that reflect the Coptic life as a whole. So icons in general visualize the church's beliefs. Icons are an integral part of the Coptic worship, inspiring and teaching the faithful mysteries of the church. Iconography is visual theology. And it's very important that we have these representations in our households. To be constantly reminded of the teachings of the church, to conform to the unity of the church. So God commands us to be of one mind. He commands us to have one faith. <clears throat> and the way that he does this is to give us the scripture that has been historically interpreted by the church. He gives us the councils. He gives us the writings of the church fathers. He gives us the liturgies of the church. He gives us the ancient hymnology. He gives us the iconography. And all this is tied together by your father confession. Who makes sure that we're on the right path. 
This is why you can go to Orthodox Church after Orthodox Church across the world and find people who are of one mind, who believe the same thing. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm concluding. I'm almost done. In Scripture, <clears throat> God commands us to be of one mind in the unity of faith and have no divisions among us. We are all commanded to believe and teach the same things. So we cannot fulfill this command as long as we hold on to personal pride. We cannot fulfill this command as long as we try to bring teachings that are outside the church into our Bible studies, into our meetings, into our homes. We have to be very careful of what we allow in terms of teachings in our homes and in our meetings. This is why Abuna has an opinion about what, what resources we're using in our meetings, whether it's the women's meeting, the men's meeting, the youth meetings, the Sunday school meetings, you name it. We have an opinion. We care. What is the context? What are we doing? What's the source? Where do they get their authority from? This is why we have to be careful that we cannot casually, you know, attend meetings that are outside the Orthodox Church because whatever I'm feeling, right? Emotional, inspiration, whatever you want to call it, it causes division. This is not in harmony with what we're talking about. The only way that we can come to a unity of belief is by humbly submitting to what Christ has taught through his church over the years. This is what the Orthodox Church tries to preserve. In this country, it's common for people to say, I'm looking for a church that believes the same way that I do. In other words, they're saying, I am right, and for the church to be right, that church has to agree with me. It's pride. It's very dangerous. So what do we do? We should ask the church, what do I need to believe? We have to submit ourselves. We have to humble ourselves. In other words, the church is right. And we are humble students who come to learn. This is the humble path. Our Lord says in the gospel today, he knew their thoughts. And he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. I pray that's never the case for this beautiful house of prayer. St. Paul says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And St. Peter says, finally, all of you be of one mind. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Blessed